Welcome to the Culture of Healthcare, Quality Measurement and Improvement. This is Lecture C. The component, the culture of healthcare, addresses job expectations in healthcare settings. It discusses how care is organized within a practice setting, privacy laws, and professional and ethical issues encountered in the workplace. The objectives for quality measurement and improvement are to define healthcare quality and the major types of quality measures, structural, process, and outcome measures. Describe the current state of healthcare quality in the United States. Discuss quality measures used in various healthcare settings in the United States, including those required for the High Tech or Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act Meaningful Use Program. Describe the role of information technology in measuring and improving healthcare quality. Describe the results of current healthcare quality efforts in the United States. This lecture discusses the role of information technology and informatics in the context of quality measurement and improvement and looks at the results of current approaches to quality measurement. What is the role of information technology, or IT, and informatics? Clearly, quality improvement can't be done without quality measurement, and measurement can't be done reliably without the use of electronic information systems to capture data. Of course, quality improvement goes beyond IT, and informatics serves a role, as demonstrated by some of the programs listed on this slide. Fowles recently published a series of case studies that demonstrated the real-world use for quality measurement and improvement. Standards are emerging for quality measures and their reporting. There is the Quality Reporting Document Architecture, or QUERTA, for quality reports, and more recently, the Hospital Quality Measures Format, abbreviated as HQMF. HQMF, or eMeasures, is an effort to retool 113 quality measures that are easy to extract from electronic health records, or EHR data, and are easy to express in HQMF. They are listed at the website on this slide. There is some evidence that EHR use is associated with better quality, or at least better quality measures in some settings, particularly inpatient settings. One analysis looked at hospitals in the University Health Consortium, a consortium of academic teaching hospitals. When they looked at sites that had achieved HIMSS, or Healthcare Information and Management System Society Analytics, Stage 4 or higher, that is, had achieved EHR adoption that includes computerized physician order entry and clinical decision support, those institutions were found to have higher scores on quality measures. Since 1994, the HIMSS Nicholas E. Davies Award of Excellence has recognized outstanding achievement of provider organizations that use information technology and EHRs to, quote, substantially improve patient outcomes while achieving return on investment. The Davies Awards program promotes EHR-enabled improvement in patient outcomes through sharing case studies and lessons learned on implementation strategies, workflow design, best practice adherence, and patient engagement. End quote. Another resource comes from the magazine Hospitals and Health Networks, which, quote, sponsors the annual Most Wired Survey, an industry standard benchmark study. The survey is designed to measure IT adoption in U.S. hospitals and health systems and is a useful tool for hospital and health system leadership to map their IT strategic plan. Health Forum, an American Hospital Association information company, distributes, collects, and analyzes the most wired data and develops benchmarks that are becoming the industry standard for measuring IT adoption for operational, financial, and clinical performance in healthcare delivery systems. End quote. The result is an annual most wired report identifying the top most wired or technology enriched hospitals in the United States. They found that most wired hospitals were more likely than other hospitals to have higher scores on certain quality measures. In outpatient settings, however, the impact of health IT systems on quality improvement is less clear. For example, a few studies have shown that the presence of an EHR didn't correlate with better quality in treatment of diabetes measures and general ambulatory quality measures. Barron's advice is useful. Better quality is not automatic and requires substantial effort. 
There are many publicly available resources for case studies and education resources. This slide provides a sampling of industry organizations that provide publicly available case studies, best practices, and examples of quality improvement activities, plus ways healthcare providers leverage those efforts to improve patient care delivery and patient care outcomes and safety. Providers rely on many resources and assets to conduct effective quality activities, including IT, organizational leadership, and staffing. The breadth of IT and software systems used for quality activities depends on the provider's size, the type of provider, and the nature of the quality activities engaged in. Small providers generally may not have the breadth of systems and technology that a large organization may have. In general, an organization can use many technology systems and tools for quality activities. Data collected for quality measures typically comes from source systems which include clinical information systems, EHRs, radiology, laboratory and physical therapy rehabilitation systems, patient care plan systems, and decision support systems, to name just a few. Financial and billing systems can be sources of data as well. Some organizations use data warehouses or similar repository tools to support data aggregation efforts. Analytics and reporting tools are used to support specific quality analysis and reporting activities. Organizational leadership and executive support is critical for a successful quality program for any provider organization. Executive support from the Chief of Medical Staff, Chief Nursing Informatics Officer, and Chief Medical Informatics Officer is needed because quality is an organization-wide effort. Executives must also engage in the organization's data governance strategies that include, quote, policies and procedures for the business use and technical management of data across the organization. Common goals of data governance are to improve data's quality, remediate its inconsistencies, share it broadly, leverage its aggregate for competitive advantage, manage change relative to data usage, and comply with internal and external regulations and standards for data usage. Data governance is an organizational structure that oversees the broad use and usability of data as an enterprise asset. End quote. Data governance is critical as quality initiatives move across multiple provider organizations throughout the patient care continuum. Quality initiatives are a matter for all staff. Specific quality studies may involve data around processes, operations, finance, patient satisfaction, or marketing of specific information as well as clinical practice and patient care. Specific quality studies direct not only the data required, but the staff that should be involved in the study. Information technology staff is indirectly involved in quality activities through support of source system applications, analytic tools, and reporting tools. Large organizations may have clinical informatics staff or healthcare informatics staff, including the chief nursing informatics officer and chief medical informatics officer, whose duties include quality initiatives. Training and education for all staff should focus on the organization's overall quality program, the quality initiatives, and staff roles. This is not a one-time education event, but an ongoing effort, since quality reporting is an ongoing activity. Very early on, quality activities were supported through use of paper. However, today's quality initiatives require IT, including data source systems, analytics tools, and reporting tools, as well as technical staff and informatics staff. Today's complexity of data collection and analytics to support multiple quality initiatives can be effectively handled only with the use of technology. There are many industry initiatives supporting the advancement of information technology and systems. A few of these are listed on this slide. A parallel effort to the High Tech EHR Meaningful Use Program is the Health IT Certification Program that provides for the certification of health IT standards, software implementation specifications, and software certification. Providers participating in the Meaningful Use Program must use a certified EHR system. As the Meaningful Use Stage regulations are updated, the EHR certification criterion is also updated to complement each stage. 
This certification program has advanced the use of data standards and system functionality, promoting effective system data collection and analytics for quality measures and reporting, as well as for patient care. In turn, the meaningful use stage measurements have promoted the engagement of patients and their families with providers, as well as the exchange of patient information across the patient care continuum. Various standards development organizations, such as Health Level 7 International, HL7 for short, support data standards development through input and work effort from industry expertise. A standards development organization has primary activities in developing, coordinating, promulgating, revising, amending, interpreting, or otherwise producing technical standards. HL7 standards are used in clinical information systems such as EHRs. There are standards and implementation guidelines for all the various types of data, including financial and billing, laboratory, and radiology and imaging, to name a few. Also, HL7 worked with the National Quality Forum and the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, or ONC, to identify and promote effective use of the EHR with quality measure standards. Integrating the Healthcare Enterprise, or IHE, supports the quality, research, and public health technical framework. Through the work of industry volunteers, various technical profiles are available for implementation to facilitate quality data collection, research, and reporting. Just a few areas addressed include clinical research, drug safety content, early hearing detection and implementation, and newborn screening, as well as aggregate data exchange and structured data capture. These tools are leveraged in the development and deployment of clinical information systems. The Commonwealth Health Alliance is a vendor-led industry organization driving interoperability services in healthcare technology that enables seamless, trusted nationwide access to healthcare information for providers. Results include provider access to IT systems that support better management of patient identity, linking patients across multiple organizations, and improved secure data access and exchange. Commonwealth services are focused on vendor adoption of neutral technology platforms that break down the barriers inhibiting effective health data exchange while promoting a national infrastructure with common standards and policies. There are many other industry initiatives that focus on the development, implementation, and promotion of information systems supporting clinical practice, improved patient care outcomes, and enhanced patient safety. Several industry efforts are focused on the demonstration of effective use of information technology and systems, along with tools and resources that providers can access to support their technology activities. The HIMSS Nicholas E. Davies Award of Excellence recognizes excellence in the implementation and use of health IT, specifically EHRs, for healthcare. Quote, organizations, private practices, and public health systems. The Davies Award is based on an evaluation framework that involves a two-step process and is modeled after the Baldridge Award. Applicants are asked for assessment and documentation of their progress based on four key areas, including management, functionality, technology, and overall value. The application process serves as an introspective self-assessment that is valuable for planning and EHR implementation. End quote. Categories include hospitals, enterprise, ambulatory, public health, and community. All Davies winner applications that are provided case studies are located on the hymns.org website. Quote, HIMSS Analytics has tracked the adoption of EMR technologies within hospitals since 2005 and within clinics since 2012 using the EMR adoption model, MRAM, and ambulatory EMR adoption model. Institutions work to complete the eight stages, 0 through 7, with the goal of reaching stage 7, an environment where paper charts are no longer used. End quote. The list of current providers that have achieved Stage 7 is located on the HIMSS website at www.himsanalytics.org slash Stage 7. Case studies are available for Stage 7 healthcare organizations that demonstrated superior use of health IT systems that resulted in improved process performance, care quality, and patient safety. 
These are accessible from the HIMSS Analytics website and includes insight on the organization's journey to achieve Stage 7 MRAM, which can be beneficial to others who are seeking to achieve MRAM status. HIMSS Analytics released the Continuity of Care Maturity Model that goes beyond MRAM Stage 7 to help, quote, optimize outcomes for health systems and patients alike. This global maturity model addresses the convergence of interoperability, information exchange, care coordination, patient engagement, and analytics with the ultimate goal of holistic individual and population health management, end quote. The HIMSS Health IT Value Suite is a resource highlighting hundreds of examples of hospitals, physician practices, communities, and accountable care organizations that have realized the full value of using IT and information systems. Resources include many detailed case studies that reveal strategy, tactics, and the measures of providers' experience in realizing the benefits and value of IT. Many industry-wide resources and IT conferences are used to assist providers in the identification and selection of the best software and technology, including those for quality-related initiatives. Class Research is an example of a firm that provides vendor and product reviews, research, as well as U.S. and international industry reports that are all focused on the effective use of IT systems. Providers can use this resource to assist in selecting the best tool for their organization. Vendor profiles are listed by software vendor type, such as quality reporting tools, EHRs, and decision support systems. These are just a few of the available resources available to providers. Whether or not EHRs are associated with improved quality, it's clear that they can augment the data that is used in quality measures. In fact, today it's really a requirement. There certainly is great value to the coded information contained in an EHR. One analysis by Tang and colleagues found that an EHR significantly improved the ability to assess diabetes quality measures. In addition, administrative data, sometimes called claims data, alone is not sufficient for calculating, for example, health care effectiveness data, and information set, or HEDIS, measures. Data from the EHR can improve the accuracy of calculating HEDIS measures, as well as calculating metrics such as disease-specific mortality. However, the existence of an EHR system doesn't necessarily mean the EHRs contain quality data. A lot of data in the EHR is narrative text that is difficult to access and process. It has been shown in heart failure, for example, that some important data needed to assess quality becomes inaccessible because it's in the form of clinical notes. One example of this is exclusion data for medications that patients should be on, such as a beta blocker or an angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitor. On the other hand, some data can be extracted by natural language processing techniques as effectively as manual abstraction in particular areas. There's no general ability to do natural language processing in every area, but in some areas, such as smoking cessation advice, the diabetic foot exam, and congestive heart failure, it's possible to create natural language processing systems that recognize data that can be used to feed quality measures. The EHR may be a mix of discrete data and text information. System applications exist that can be applied to text for data mining resulting in data that can be reportable and ultimately used in quality reporting. These systems are not perfect and they require human oversight. However, they provide another tool to support data retrieval that can be used in quality reporting activities. Next is a discussion of the results of current approaches to quality measurement and a review of research that has attempted to determine whether better performance on quality measures particularly process measures, leads to improved patient outcomes. There's evidence both for and against these approaches, and other problems might arise from the current strategies to measure quality. The U.S. healthcare system is moving away from the traditional fee-for-service model, payment regardless of patient outcomes or quality, and toward a pay-for-performance or P4P model that links provider payment to the patient's outcome of care. The Accountable Care Organization, or ACO, is one model in the United States 
that supports p for p based on the results of patient care outcomes demonstrated by all providers across the patient care continuum. Although some have failed, ACOs have explored ways to change the current provider reimbursement methodology under health care payment reform. The English Quality and Outcomes Framework is a P4P program that ties 25% of the pay for general practitioners in England to their performance on 129 quality indicators. The initial assumption was that there would be about 75% achievement, but there actually has been about 97% achievement, which has ended up increasing the cost of the program because the targets for higher quality care were met by most physicians. Another finding is that most of the quality improvement occurred as the program was starting and has since leveled off. Of note is that one of the major unintended consequences of this program has been its excess focus on the EHR and all its prompts for quality measures. On a positive note, another study found that the quality gaps in care for more deprived areas has been reduced. So, does better performance on process measures lead to better outcomes? Yes and no. Patients who choose a top-performing hospital or surgeon, one in the top quartile, have one-half the mortality rate of those who choose a hospital or surgeon in the lowest quartile. If all patients could make this choice, they would likely experience lower mortality. It has also been shown that participation in the Hospital Quality Alliance by hospitals is associated with lower mortality for myocardial infarction, or MI, pneumonia, and congestive heart failure, CHF. In addition, it has been shown that adopting the leapfrog group practices is associated with better quality and lower mortality for acute MI, so there are some instances where better performance on quality measures leads to better outcomes. Unfortunately, the story does not end there. Other studies have produced negative findings. One, for example, found that across various quality process measures, hospitals could predict only small differences in mortality from MI, CHF, and pneumonia. Another study found that the measures for quality of care of CHF, developed by the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, have little relationship to mortality or rehospitalization rates. Perhaps one of the most negative studies showed that hospitals that participated in a particular p for p quality effort didn't produce an improved quality of care. The hospitals didn't do any better in the quality measures, and of course, none of the patients had better outcomes. Other studies have been negative as well. In one, a smoking cessation quality metric didn't correlate with actual smoking cessation. In another, a door-to-balloon measure for acute MI didn't correlate with other quality measures or mortality. Finally, use of Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, heart failure measures, has not been associated with better outcome. Does public reporting have any effect on quality measures? A recent systematic review looked at studies addressing this question and found that there was very little evidence of improved quality of care when the performance of a physician or hospital was publicly reported. Another study, however, did show that public reporting, when combined with P4P, improved performance and quality measures compared to public reporting alone. Another study looked at general internists in the United States and assessed their views on approaches to quality. It found that many internists supported financial incentives for quality, but they had concerns for public reporting, especially the impact that it would have on the incentive to care for patients who were sicker or had more complex medical conditions. More recently, studies have shown that public report cards in Canada didn't improve indicators for MI or CHF and that patients have difficulty understanding such report cards, suggesting a better approach might consist of a framework and plain language. The next topic examines some of the challenges, limitations, and ethical issues in quality measurement and improvement. There are a number of challenges related to quality measurement. One of these issues, for example, is in elderly patients, who often have complex comorbidities with multiple diseases present. These may render recommendations and guidelines, which sometimes work their way into performance measures, as inappropriate. The UK P4P system, for example, 
allows exclusions based on various factors. One analysis addressed the issue of whether this practice might result in practitioners trying to game the system by trying to get patients excluded when they should not be, and this was found not to be the case. Another issue is that the care of patients in Medicare tends to be dispersed among many physicians. A patient may have a primary care physician and then see a specialist affiliated with a different hospital. So it's difficult to attribute quality to a physician or hospital when the patient's care is shared by several practitioners. New results in clinical trials can render some measures obsolete. Given the recent changes in recommendations for lowering cholesterol and the treatment of diabetes, if the results from a clinical trial don't support the recommendations of current quality measures, then these measures can become obsolete. Some measures have unintended consequences. Robert Wachter, a well-known writer and quality expert, gives the somewhat funny, although concerning, example of patients who came into his hospital at the University of California, San Francisco, with CHF and get treated with antibiotics inappropriately. Why do they get treated with antibiotics when they come in with CHF? When an acutely ill patient presents at the hospital, a clinician first applies diagnostic efforts to determine whether the patient has pneumonia. The diagnosis of CHF is not always immediately clear, and the clinician may choose to observe the patient. However, some physicians may prescribe antibiotics to ensure that they meet the quality measure, only to discover later that the patient has CHF. It has also been shown that the multiplicity of measures leads to conflict reports, such as in stroke care, where some measures used for other types of patients may not be appropriate for all stroke patients. Additional analysis has found that most physicians don't have large enough practice caseloads to reliably measure differences. Berwick has suggested a need to focus on multiple measures and on all players, not just Medicare or one insurer. There are also challenges for certain practice environments. Some of the measures have been configured, for example, such that small numbers of patients in smaller hospitals can inflate performance relative to large hospitals. Measures need to be adjusted for different settings. It has also been shown that safety net hospitals have ongoing issues with funding and staffing that impact their ability to provide quality care. They are, after all, safety net hospitals where people can go for care when they may not have other options. In fact, the mission of these institutions could be adversely affected if tied into P for P, and this measure may actually worsen some of the health care disparities that these institutions are set up to address. Finally, small medical practices have challenges. These practices have limited time, multiple payers, and relatively small amounts of money for capital investment. For the area of Massachusetts in which one physician practices, he asks, is it becoming overly burdensome for some of these practices to be overwhelmed by all of these different quality measurements and other aspects of computerization of their practices? There are also some ethical issues for brief analysis. Further exploration of the papers listed on this slide is highly recommended for those who seek a deeper understanding of ethical issues. One issue concerns patient consent. When someone takes part in a research project, there's a process of protection for human participants. This issue came to the fore when a research project looking at the implementation of quality measures had not been properly vetted by the Institutional Review Board or the Human Subjects Committee to determine whether the research protocols were ethical. So a decision needs to be made on whether to treat quality interventions as part of patient care or as research. Lynn, Snyder, and Miller explore this issue and tend to advocate that it be viewed as part of care. There is also the issue of who pays for preventable complications. It's advocated that the patient not be responsible. Of course, the challenge is the identification of truly preventable complications. It is obvious that an object left in a patient is a preventable complication, and most would agree that the organization should be penalized in some way. Other complications, however, are less obvious. When a patient gets pneumonia on a ventilator, is it because the patient was insufficiently suctioned, or improperly moved, or not put into isolation? 
Whether such a case of pneumonia is truly a preventable complication is unclear, and the question of whether it should be paid for is a little murky. The Affordable Care Act raises a similar potential issue with the Hospital Readmissions Reduction Program, which requires CMS to reduce payments to participating hospitals that have excess readmissions of patients within 30 days of their hospital discharge. There are also tensions regarding quality issues. For example, customers and purchasers may have different priorities when it comes to quality measurement. Customers may want to see everything and have everything focused on their improved care. Purchasers may be more focused on the economic aspects. Tension also exists between the desire to improve care and not always having knowledge of the best ways to do so. There may also be tensions between a physician's internal motivations for his or her patients and P4P initiatives. One study fortunately found that the internal motivations of physicians were not adversely impacted in a P4P situation. Finally, how can a high-performance healthcare provider system be achieved? The Institute of Medicine, the ONC, and others have talked of the need to build a learning healthcare system. Such a system requires an infrastructure, including informatics, to learn what works. This issue was addressed in a recent report by the Commonwealth Fund, an organization that has been measuring the quality problems in healthcare. It advocates that the high performance healthcare provider be guided by certain principles, detailed in its report and summarized on this slide. All patients should have access to care and information, but they should also be held accountable for that information and for making appropriate decisions. Healthcare providers then must provide coordination of care across the patient care continuum and take on this notion of continuous learning and improvement. Some have argued the value of focusing more on the value of care than on its quality. CMS updated the 2016 Quality Strategy, which was released in November 2015. Quote, CMS's goal is to shift Medicare payments from volume to value, tying 30% of traditional Medicare payments to alternative payment models and tying 85% of all traditional Medicare payments to quality or value, all by the end of 2016. End quote. These goals will drive a health care provider system that delivers improved care, spends health care dollars more wisely, and makes our communities healthier. Clearly, health care providers must be at the top of their game for supporting this new quality strategy. Quote, the 2016 CMS quality strategy goals reflect the six priorities set out in the NQS and identify quality-focused objectives that CMS can drive or enable to further these goals. Goal 1. Make care safer by reducing harm caused in the delivery of care. Goal 2. Strengthen person and family engagement as partners in care. Goal 3. Promote effective communication and coordination of care. Goal 4. Promote effective prevention and treatment of chronic disease. Goal 5. Work with communities to promote best practices of healthy living. And goal six, make care affordable. End quote. Quote, to meet these six goals, CMS will measure and publicly report providers' quality performance and cost of services provided, provide technical assistance and foster learning networks for quality improvement, adopt evidence-based national coverage determinations, Create incentives for quality and value. Set standards for providers that support quality improvement. And create survey and certification processes that evaluate capacity for quality assurance and quality improvement. End quote. This concludes Lecture C of Quality Measurement and Improvement. In summary, the lecture has shown that there's an important role for informatics and IT in helping to measure healthcare quality. The research to date on quality measurement and improvement efforts shows mixed results. There are also challenges in measuring quality, particularly in certain practice environments, as well as ethical issues to resolve. This concludes quality measurement and improvement. This unit discussed the three major types of healthcare quality measures, structural, process, and outcome measures.
Many different instances of these health care quality measures are used in a variety of settings, from health plans to inpatient to outpatient, including those that are part of the high-tech meaningful use program. Information technology has an important role in measuring and improving health care quality. Finally, the results of current health care quality efforts in the United States show mixed successes and a number of challenges.